I've always found computer cooling very interesting, especially air cooling. In this video, I will try my best to explain how air coolers work, general heat transfer, and why I think air coolers make a very good thermal solution. Heat transfer is the flow of energy from one place to another. It is a thermally driven process, which means we need a temperature difference in order for the kinetic energy to be exchanged. Let's start talking about the different modes of heat transfer, conduction, convection, and radiation. By far, the best mode of heat transfer is conduction. Conduction is how heat is transferred within a solid material. Since the atoms are very close together, it is easy for the kinetic energy to be exchanged. Materials can be classified into either conductors, insulators, or semiconductors. Metal is a conductor, while something like wood or glass is an insulator. Semiconductors fall somewhere in between, depending on their state, and may be more conductive or more insulative. As a general rule, the more electrically conductive something is, the more thermally conductive. Next is convection, which is considerably worse at heat transfer than conduction. Convection is how heat is transferred through a fluid, whether that be air, water, etc. Since the atoms are more spread out, it is harder for them to transfer energy to one another. We can easily demonstrate how much worse convection is compared to conduction with a frying pan. I can easily hold my hand over the center without being burned. The heat from the pan is not being transferred to my hand fast enough. However, if I press my hand into the pan, I'll get some nasty burn marks. The last mode of heat transfer is radiation, where the heat is transferred from the exchange of photons. This mode is by far the worst and is the working principle for vacuum flasks. Anything that has heat gives off low energy photons. This allows objects to be seen by thermal cameras. The nice part about radiation is that no gas or solid is needed for the heat transfer, and thus is the only heat transfer found in space. Those white fins on the space station are heat sinks for radiation. Radiation is so poor of a mode of heat transfer that for the most part we can ignore it for heat sink design. You can also test out radiation heat transfer at home by wearing a dark colored shirt in front of a fireplace. Okay, let's look at a tower heatsink. The job of a computer heatsink is to transfer the heat from the processor into the air. We can see we need a lot of surface area for the convection portion, but only a small surface area for the conduction portion. To better understand how the heatsink works, let's break them into different sections. The fins, forced air, heat pipes, and the base. The most standout feature of a heatsink are the fins. There are too many of them to count. The fins are where conduction meets convection, and as I said earlier, convection is a really poor mode of heat transfer compared to conduction. Thus, to improve the heat transfer, we need a lot of them to make a difference. The more surface area, the more heat we can move into the air. But this is not the whole story. The temperature of the surface is also important. The larger difference in the temperature between the fluid and the fins, the more heat is moved. Notice fins get all of their heat via the conduction from the heat pipes on either side. In order for us to have an efficient fin, we must be able to conduct the heat and spread it evenly over the surface. The material and the thickness of the fin help us determine this. Most fins are made of either aluminum or copper, both of which are very good conductors. Aluminum is more common, it is cheaper than copper, and the gains between copper and aluminum are small. There is also an unforeseen consequence of using aluminum. That being, it is a very reactive metal, and thus develops a small oxide coating on its surface. This oxide is an insulator and can make a small difference in fin performance. It can make a larger impact on conduction interfaces, and thus most heat sinks use a copper base to avoid this. The thickness of the fin also helps spread out the heat. The thicker the fin, the more heat can be moved. All these variables need to be balanced in order to maximize performance, cost, weight, and size. The most hypnotizing part of the heatsink is the spinning fan. We all know if the fan dies, the CPU will most likely overheat. However, the fan does not move that much air, just a little bit. So why is there a huge difference between having no air and a little air? This has to do with forced convection. As the hot fin transfers heat into the air, the air warms up. We all know that hot air rises, but it moves relatively slowly and thus creates a warm air boundary around the fin. Remember, a temperature difference is what drives heat transfer, so having this hot air really slows it down. With a fan, we can push the hot air out of the way and replace it with cooler air. There is still a boundary layer, but we can reduce the height of it. This is true if we assume that the air is flowing in a nice orderly flow, i.e. laminar flow. We can improve the heat transfer if we can get the air to start mixing. This is called turbulent flow.
We can promote mixing by having rough structures on the fin, such as bumps, stamps, lips, etc. One problem with turbulent flow is that it can be very violent, and thus make audible noises or vibrations. Now the more air we move over the fin, the better the heat transfer. The velocity of the air relates to the heat transfer by a square root. Thus, a little bit of airflow makes a huge difference, but at higher airflows, not so much. Notice where the heat pipes are placed in relation to the fan. They are where the fan generates the most amount of air velocity, and thus, the most amount of air is over the hottest spot, maximizing heat transfer. So if your CPU fan is screaming, it is having a really hard time moving the heat. Next, let's talk about heat pipes. If not for the invention and optimization of heat pipes, then things like laptops would not exist in the form that they are today. Heat pipes transfer heat by using a phase change. A huge amount of energy is required to change a liquid into a gas, and during this transition, the temperature of the liquid stays the same. You can test this at home. Take a pot of water and put it on the stove to boil. Notice it will take a short amount of time for the water to start boiling. However, you would have to wait a really long time for the water to completely evaporate. Now check this out. I have a really hard time holding my hand over the boiling water. The steam is transferring heat to my hand as it condenses. At atmosphere, water boils at 100 degrees Celsius, which is too hot for processors. However, if we lower the pressure, we can also lower the boiling temperature. Therefore, to make a heat pipe, we use a little bit of water and low pressure inside the pipe to keep the fluid and saturated vapor at the temperature that we want to operate. The inside surface of the pipe is roughened to promote capillary flow of the water. This means that no matter how we orient the pipe, it will still work effectively. As the processor gets hot, the liquid will evaporate and capillary action will pull liquid from the surrounding areas to replace the evaporated liquid. The steam travels down the pipe to find a colder spot and condenses, thus transferring heat. The liquid is then drawn back to the hot spot, completing the cycle. If there is no cooler spot, the liquid will all turn to steam and the transfer of the heat will no longer be efficient. Therefore, it is important in the case of a computer heatsink that the fins and the forced air convection do their job to keep the upper portion of the pipe cool or else the heat transfer slows. Heat pipes are really good conductors compared to solid metal and thus greatly improve the heatsink effectiveness. Lastly, let's talk about the base. The base is where the heatsink comes in contact with the CPU heat spreader. It is also where the cooler mechanically mounts to the computer. We can think of the base like a really short, fat fin and therefore the temperature throughout the base is very uniform. Most heatsink bases are made out of copper or aluminum with copper being the standard. What is important for the base is that it is well machined and flat. If there is any air gaps between the heatsink and the CPU heat spreader, convection cells are formed. Again, convection is really poor compared to conduction and is a really bad thing. To minimize this, we use heatsink compound to fill in the gaps as well as applying some mounting pressure to compress the metal like a spring. Not much mounting pressure is needed to ensure a good interface. For me, air coolers are a really great thermal solution. Looking from an engineering point of view, they check everything on the list. They are cheap, reliable, high performance systems. A really simple, elegant solution that don't have any moving parts and incorporate some interesting science. I hope you enjoyed this video, and if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments below. As always, if you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe, and thanks for watching.